There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. up in a family that was very scientifically minded, uh, you call them scientific materialists, I guess. They, they didn't think that anything existed if you couldn't see it under a microscope or you couldn't touch it and feel it and so on and so forth. And that's kind of who I was. I would say I was, as I finished uh, college and university, I was an agnostic. Uh, I didn't really have any ideas or thoughts or interest in spirituality. But I had an experience when I was about 25 years old. I was living in Baltimore, Maryland. I was working at an advertising agency and living with, I was a bachelor living with two other guys in an apartment. And, and uh, <clears throat> I came down with the flu or some kind of illness and I, I really got very sick. And long story short, uh, I suddenly found myself looking down at my passed out body on the bed. And I thought, you know, here I am up by the ceiling and I'm looking down there. I felt fine, but I was just, I thought, you know, I'm up here and my body's down there and how can that possibly be? And the next thing I knew, I, it was the next morning and I woke up, but I remembered that experience very vividly of being out of my body. And I thought, you know, there's something going on about reality that, I don't, that I'm not aware of because if your brain creates consciousness and I can be outside of my body looking at my, looking at my body where my brain is, how can that possibly be? Since the beginning of modern science going back hundreds of years, the answer to one question has remained elusive. However far our studies of neurology go, however closely we map the human brain, or any animal brain for that matter, it appears that there are parts of our being that are yet hidden. The approach and theory that everything that is exists in a physical form in some way, is being increasingly challenged. That which we now know as our consciousness is posing a problem to those trying to find it in a physical sense. Phenomena such as the near-death experience, the out-of-body experience, dream walking, remote viewing, psychic mediumship and reincarnation all go against what we know and can study. And while some may not believe in the above being real in the sense that we know them, there's a mountain of evidence to the contrary. Thus, if we are to believe that even a mere 1% of the evidence of these things is true, then there must exist a form of being which is outside the physical body. As German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said, all truth passes three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Secondly, it's violently opposed. Then, thirdly, it can be widely accepted. Where you personally are on that scale will differ, of course. But if we're to get to the grand truths of these strange things, we must be willing to take the risks, suffer the ridicule, stand up to the opposition, and stay together. My guest tonight is spearheading the research and reporting of such things, and his wide collection of excellent books cover many aspects of the human consciousness. 
It's a joy to welcome the great Stephen Hawley Martin to the show tonight, to talk through his work and his books, and to explain how, if we want to understand what we truly are at the base level, we should all try without pause to peer beyond the veil. I, uh, I, I think that my blood pressure just suddenly dropped. Uh, and, and it was just a momentary thing. It wasn't like a near-death experience, I don't think. I think it was, uh, it really just was an out-of-body experience. It was sort of a spontaneous thing that happened. I, I sort of passed out. I think I just, right before it happened, I felt the bed spinning around or my body spinning around sort of like a helicopter when it's taken off, you know, and then suddenly I was looking down and I, there was my body. And, and I think it was just, uh, my blood pressure dropped. I don't know. But anyway, it happened and, and it started me on this journey. Have you ever tried to recreate it? No, not really. Uh, I, I think that we do go out of our bodies into an astral realm when, we, when we're sleeping and certainly when we're having a, a lucid dream. And I do have those every once in a while. And they're actually, actually a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, I think it's just, it does happen to people sometimes. I've talked to others that have had similar experiences where, again, it's not a near-death thing where you go through the tunnel and you go to the light and you see your dead grandparents or whatever uh, or having it past life review. I've talked to a lot of people who've done that, but that wasn't what it was. It was more like a thing that happened. To, I don't know if you're familiar with Bob Monroe, who uh, was very much, the, he was the one who coined the phrase OBE, out of body experience. Uh, he wrote a book probably 30 or 40 years ago called uh, Journeys Out of the Body. But he had a kind of a spontaneous out of body experience that started him being interested in this sort of thing. And it was, he was lying in bed and he was listening to music and suddenly he was looking down at himself. And of course, what he did as a result of that, he was a radio broadcaster, made a lot of money. And he uh, uh, developed sound techniques that can generate out of body experiences. And he has uh, had, he's dead now, I think he died 25 years ago, an organization up not far from me in the uh, foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia called the Monroe Institute. And you can go there for a weekend and uh, cost a couple of thousand dollars, I believe, but I do have friends who've done it. And he has these chambers that they put you in and this music, they call it hemisync music, the place, and people have out-of-body experiences as a result of that so uh it's it's you know it happens yeah i've heard the stories of it being able to be mastered through uh perhaps meditation um certain meditation techniques that involve i can't go into it but starting to focus the energy on the feet and pulling it up and then focusing the energy on the knee and then on the pelvis and uh, to the point where it reaches the, you know, the, the, the third eye or whatever it might be, and then focusing on popping out. And it's reported that there can be a popping sound, you know, as, mm -hmm. as the, the soul leaves the body, that it is this thing that you have control over uh, and potentially we all have control over. Um, we just don't know we do or we just don't know how to, to control that sort of thing. So it's... Yeah. You know, now that you mentioned, I have seen a, a video on uh, YouTube. I think the guy's name is Aaron Abke, who uh, has uh, explains what you just said, how, how to induce an out-of-body experience. And uh, he says the best time to do it is like in the morning after you, when you've just sort of uh, woken up and, uh, and then he has this whole technique he goes through about doing it so but you know I'm not really I'm not so much interested in doing that I don't know sure <laughs> been there done that <laughs> I mean it's just it's just one tiny part of um of this enigma that is our consciousness and and where it places in well, in existence, where it places in the world. It's obviously not a tangible thing. Every part of the human brain has now been mapped. We know, we like to think we know what every little, you know, square 
square centimeter of the human brain now does, yet we have no record of any of it controlling consciousness. Right. Um, well, the, you know, I think it's uh, pretty clear to me now that the brain does not create consciousness, that the brain is a receiver of consciousness. It's how your soul, your body, your mind is able to operate in this three-dimensional physical reality. It's, you know, the only way to get here is through a mother's womb uh, and operate in this reality. It's more like a deep sea diving suit is to a guy who goes down and has some job to do under a bridge in a deep sea suit. Uh, that's, that's what the human body is and the brain is our connection. It's what uh, allows us to operate this physical body that we're in. But it's a temporary situation where we're uh, spiritual beings having a, a physical experience. That's you know gotten to be a cliche, but I believe it. Yeah, yeah. Was it, was it something on the, that I read of yours that said we're not physical beings having a spiritual experience? We're spiritual beings having temporary physical experiences. Yeah, I well, I I don't know. It, you... it could be, and that's certainly, I believe that. I believe we're spiritual beings having a temporary physical experience that we've probably all had many of them and we just don't remember them, but a lot of people do. You know, I've got yeah. a friend who remembers a number of past lives. And... Consciousness, mind, is the ground of being. That is, it, everything comes from mind. It's what the quantum physicists call the unified field. And uh, this is not a new idea. It's something that the ancient rishis of India three or 4,000 years ago believed. And there in fact are, and I've talked to quantum physicists who think the rishis were right. They use different terminology they said that it came from what they called Veda, V-E-D-A, Veda. But to me, Veda is the unified field, and the unified field is uh, infinite mind. It is intelligence, but it's also consciousness. And all everything comes from that, and that we are each a, a piece of that. And, and the uh, book, Consciousness, The Hard, Hard Problem Solved, uh, goes into some uh, experiments by quantum physicists that, that demonstrate that. You know, the double split experiment you're probably familiar with, but uh, others as well, as, as well as the fact that uh, a lot of research has been done that hasn't been reported on about ESP and, and uh, the efficacy of prayer and uh, by, you know, there's one study in prayer done at the at Columbia University. It's an Ivy League school in their medical school, where uh, there were women in Korea, South Korea, who were un undergoing in vitro fertilization to try to get pregnant, and they had one group that was prayed for and by people in the United States and Australia and uh, Canada, and the other group was the control group and the. The group in uh, that was prayed for had a 50% success rate, and the group that was not prayed for had a 26% success rate. Well, you know, the United States and Canada, and even Australia, is a long way from Korea, which suggests that mind is everywhere, and that prayer works, especially when it's trying to help something that that. He, enhances evolution of the human race, which is having people born. If you look at, um, you look at things like remote viewing, certainly ESP, but phenomena like time slips, these are situations whereby it seems like obviously time and space are fully malleable things that don't seem to apply, and this is clearly a hypothesis, that don't seem to apply to consciousness, that almost once you have passed out of the physical world that we're in now, that there's a fluidity to whatever is on the outside that allows the conscious being, the conscious energy to 
to move through time and space in a, in a way that's not something that we're familiar with. Yes, well, I think that, uh, that outside of this physical three-dimensional four, if you count time, reality, there really isn't time, at least not in the way we think of it. It's, it's, an, it's eternity in the sense that there's no beginning, no end, no real time. I have interviewed at great length uh, a gentleman named Skip Atwater, who was the man who set up a research unit for the, U for the United States Army back in the Cold War that used psychics to spy on the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries, and apparently was very successful at doing that. And that's what, you're, what you would call uh, remote viewing. And yes, he said one of the tricks was to know when what they were viewing happened, whether it was present time, past time, or future time. Now, I don't believe that futures set or fixed, but I do think that there are probable futures which can be accessed through remote viewing. I mean, one of the things that Edgar Cayce said, who, who was the most renowned psychic of the 20th century, people called him the sleeping prophet, was that time is not fixed, that we have free will and we can, we can change we can change the future by changing, uh, by making a decision, you know, just like Back to the Future, that movie. Something happens or you make a decision and it changes everything. But there are probable futures. I had it explained to me by Ed Edgar Casey's son before he died, that it, it was like uh, a, viewing a two-dimensional plane where you see a bug going across the rug and if he keeps going in the direction he's going, you can see where he'll be in five minutes. But the bug can change directions. <laughs> he, can, he can decide to go to the left or the right. So anyway, that's, it's an interesting topic and, and I don't pretend to have so all the answers. Was that following some sort of theory of not quite the multiverse, not, this, not an infinite multiverse, but something where there are multiple probabilities laid out and then you just have control of which one happens. So every probability not, not still happens, but do, do you get what, do you get the question? I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, there are probable futures and, and those are out there to be viewed, I suppose. And if there are some that are more probable than others. And, uh, but Casey did make it very clear. I mean, he made some, a lot of predictions, some of which have come true. But when he made them, he said, you know, it's only a problem. It's not set in stone. So we can change our future. If we change your beliefs, change your reality. There's a house that was used as a hospital in the Civil War, uh, not far from, from where I live in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, someone went in there and opened a door and saw a Confederate soldier who was wounded or whatever and, you know, like freaked out and ran. I mean, he, but he swears he did, you know. And so who knows, maybe. But that, that would have been, you know, at that time, it would have been a hundred years since that soldier was there. It also shows uh, that certainly extends into the kind of near-death experience um, experience that a, a, a lot of the the anecdotal evidence that comes from the people who've been through that will say that almost time paused. They saw themselves uh, leave the body, or they found themselves out of the body. They saw their body maybe in a hospital bed the grieving wife or the sitting in the armchair at the side, but both paused as though within that moment when that consciousness, whatever that existence has come out of the body to allow it to witness the, the physical body. Yeah. That well, time has either stood still or it's ceased to exist in the manner that we understand it to, to exist. Yeah, I think it ceases to exist in the manner we understand it would be my guess. Uh, I, I've talked to people that have had these out-of-body experiences, and one of the things that's common to many of them, 
is the past life review, which they say they see their entire life unfold from birth to when they just passed uh, in front of them. And they experience each of those critical episodes that took place where they, they, they feel what they felt, that they also feel what the person they did it to felt and that kind of thing. And, and that those things could take weeks to happen, but in fact, it all happens when they get back from this out of body uh, near death experience. You know, it happened in less than 10 minutes where sure. while they were there, it seemed to have taken a week or whatever. So yeah, yeah the time is, time is malleable or it's, it's different there yeah. than it is here. I used to go to France a lot. My first, first wife was France, and uh, we had this good friend. A friend, my wife's married this guy that I got to be good friends with, and they had a inherited a house in the country, very large. You know what would be called a chateau in the country, and and they decided to renovate the thing, and uh, they would go out there, and the workmen were you know putting a new roof on and all that kind of stuff. It hadn't been lived in since. This was back in the 80s, since before World War II. And so it needed a lot of repair, but they would go out there for the weekend, and see how things were going. And as he was going to sleep at night, he would, just before he would drift off to sleep, he would hear someone screaming for help. And this went on, you know, every, every night practically, and he would get up and go and try to see where it was coming from. Eventually, he felt that uh, it was coming from somewhere down in the cellar. So he got the workmen to go down there. He saw this wall that looked a little newer than the other walls, and they tore it down. And behind the wall was a skeleton, and they took the skeleton and gave it a Christian burial and he stopped hearing the night noises. Well, it, the, the explanation that he gave and which seems reasonable to me was that this guy must have been bopped on the head, bricked up behind this wall, came to after he was back there and had been trying to get out ever since and didn't know that he had died, which must have happened probably anywhere from 50 to 100 years prior. So, but anyway, interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. So that's obviously a that's obviously a situation whereby the you know the body has long died. I imagine died fairly quickly after being bricked up in a wall. Um, yeah. 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 Well, that the idea that uh, people don't know they're dead is is pretty common. Uh, yeah, sure. That's one of the things that the the, the folks up at uh, the Monroe Institute, which we mentioned earlier do is they when they go out of body they they will come upon someone who uh one in one case it was a sailor who thought he was he, his ship was wrecked and he was holding on to a life raft or something like that and, and he'd been doing that after later on they calculated it'd been 30 years and they talked to him and said hey, you know you're dead you know go to the light and they did get him to do that but apparently that's it's, uh, that happens and it's fairly common The UFO thing is interesting to me. I'm, I haven't really studied that uh, like I have other psychic phenomena, but uh, and I'm not sure that UFO is psychic phenomena, but I have a suspicion it may be. I had a, my boss when I first got out of, uh, when I first graduated from university was a uh, retired Air Force colonel who had been a pilot and he told me over drinks one day that uh, when he was he was flying this transport plane across the Atlantic, large plane, crew of five on it, that a UFO orb, a light bright orb came up and rode right alongside the cockpit uh, for half an hour. And that everyone on the plane saw it, that he filed a report with the, with the Air Force and all the crew vouched for it. And that was the last he heard of it. But yeah. the thing flew along for half an hour and then it shot off to the right 
in a way that was impossible for any kind of conventional aircraft to do. And so it seems to me that it's some kind of psychic phenomena. Maybe these UFOs are really coming from another dimension or something like that. Sure. Uh, I think they're probably some sort of higher form of, uh, of uh, beings and uh, uh, intelligence that uh, are checking us out and uh, probably have decided we're not quite ready for them to land on the White House lawn and go knock on the door and say, we'd like to see President uh, Biden. But I think eventually it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime. But I, I believe that the Pentagon is going to release uh, a report that they say is full disclosure on UFOs somewhere in the next couple of months, around the 1st of June is what I've heard. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what... Well, was it the Washington Post only last week said that they had credible intel, if you want to call it that for a newspaper, that there was going to be an, a fairly imminent release of, of of either more videos or something fairly major coming up. And I think... Yeah, got... that must be what they're talking about. The person that I, I saw someone interviewed on a TV show, uh, I think his name's John Radcliffe, but he was the, the head of all of intelligence for the Trump administration. And he said that that's what was going to happen. And that once they did, he would to interview him again, because he had a lot of stuff he could talk about, but he couldn't talk about it until then. So, yeah. But yeah. what fascinates me is the, the there's still it. So, so as I say, this obviously is starting to cement and we will hopefully see very soon that this is a physical situation. They're physical craft there. I mean, they're picked up on F-18 gun cameras. They're not coming out of the pilot's head. Um, right. We are led to believe. We, we would believe in our current knowledge. But at the same time, um, contact the experience where people feel they've been above craft. You have the time distortion, which again is something we're looking at in, in terms of out-of-body experience and near-death experience. Um, it tends to be the flip the other way. So you feel like you've only been gone 10 minutes, but it might be five days. Um, yeah. But still you have that that situation where time doesn't operate the same way. You also have um, situations whereby people may have seen a craft in the sky very clearly, but the person in the passenger seat next to them can't see it. Um, mm. You know, explain that. You have, a, you have situations where where everybody sees... Uh, an old Spitfire going over, but one person says, it's not a Spitfire, look, it's a silver dome. And everyone else is saying, it's not a silver dome. Look, you can see the propeller. And they're saying, what are you talking about? It's not green with a propeller. It's a silver dome with no, and it's not making any, and you so you have this. I mean, again, it's all, all anecdotal, but then, then all of this is. This, this, these weird anomalous kind of glitches with some of this stuff, which is, which just throw the whole debate around it into into perhaps it being two different things. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's wild. Yeah, but I'm excited to see that report when it comes out. I'm, I, hope to, I hope it does. Yeah, Maybe we'll wow. learn something. Do you think we're we're approaching a, a stage where some of these some of these kind of fringe studies can become a little bit more studyable in the classic sense? I do. I think that we're going through a time of transition. You know, the world views have changed over the last two thousand years. I don't know how many times. I mean, we started out; the world was flat heaven was above, uh, hell was below, <laughs> then, uh, you know, Columbus and, and uh, sails the ocean blue, and, then, and the, now the world is round, but it's still at the center of the universe, and then, you know, along comes Galileo, and, and oh, this earth goes around the sun, but it's the center of the universe, and on Hubble, and he sees all these other galaxies, and the red shift, and the 
the uh, universe is expanding and we're just a little speck at the edge of the Milky Way. And so, you know, our view of reality and what, what our, our worldview just keeps changing. And I think it's changing now. I think we're going from uh, a worldview that, that started back in the 18th century that uh, you know, the great clockmaker theory where God wound up, the, created the universe, wound it up, let it go. But that's all there is, is physical reality. And we're going from that to realizing that there's a whole lot more than just physical substance that and, and I think that, that it's, it's mind. It's that mind, that consciousness is the ground of being, that all comes from that, and that we're each a little hologram of the whole, as we've already discussed, I think. So, yeah, I think we're going through that change right now. When I first started writing about this 20 years ago, I got much more uh, sharp criticism and... Uh, and people arguing with me than I do now. Now it's hard to find somebody who will really uh, go out on a limb and say, you know, you're wrong. Nothing exists if you can't see it under a microscope. I haven't found anybody in the last five years who will who will take that position. Although I, I believe they still exist. I just think they're staying quiet because they know they can't defend it. There's just so much evidence otherwise. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits, um, you know, for all its faults, of something such as the internet, that actually these these disparate stories, tales, pieces of evidence, experiences, experiences, globally are able now to co collect and connect into one community. Now you can just go online and you can find all these people. You can find, and 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 ninety nine percent of them may be mistaken, wrong lying that mm -hmm. but there's a one percent and and you can gather those people together quite easily now yeah yeah i agree i agree it's definitely true and and uh and i think it's a good thing because i think that once we more of us know that when the when the worldview shifts to the idea that really all is one that we're all connected by this this intelligence this this consciousness that actually the consciousness that I have is the same consciousness that you have. It's the I am in us, the, the silent observer that can step outside of ourselves figuratively and look at our own thoughts and consider the universe. And that's something that we really all share. We're really all one. And, and once we realize that, it's going to be harder for us to be angry at others because they have a different point of view or you know, they have a different skin color or whatever is different about them. They're really, none of us are different underneath. We all share the same mind. We're all connected to it. We're all one. And uh, that's something that people realize when they have these out-of-body experiences and they have that past life review. They, they not only feel what they felt at the time they did something to somebody, but they feel what that person felt. You know, whether they felt joy because you did something nice to them or whether they felt anger because you said something bad to them or whatever it may be. So they're, they're, they come back realizing that, that we're all connected. So yeah. I think it's a good- Also thing. extends into the reincarnation uh, topic as well, that actually you are only you in, a, in, your, current, in, in your current guise. You are just you for the, for the time being. And actually when you come back, you may be- uh, of a different gender, of a different could be a different race. gender, different race, different animal. I mean, I don't don't know how it works. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think we come back as animals, but I do think we can come back in a different body, a bit, uh, we could different sex and uh, a different race. Uh, I've had the some of my past lives uh, have been told to me by psychics who do this sort of thing for a living. And, you know, one incarnation I had was, was way back in ancient China. So uh, I've been Chinese. Uh, I'm sure that, well, any of us, even if we don't believe in reincarnation, know that, uh, you know, we all started out in Africa and we spread out around the world. So, you know, our ancestors <laughs> have been black or whatever. I mean, it, it's, uh, 
It, it's interesting to think about, but I do believe that reincarnation is a thing. I think that we're born over and over and over again until, until we get it right, until we are ready to move on to another higher level of reality than, than this one. So, so do, you, do you subscribe to the idea that, that, is, uh, that that's maybe something that the past life review is addressing? That you, there's, there's obviously a theory that you, when you reincarnated, you come back having learned the lessons of your previous lives. Well, I think you come back to learn lessons and that uh, you probably, and, and this is something that is, in, in people that do past life regressions and they even do between live uh, regressions where people remember being in, in under hypnosis, remember being uh, between lives and, and deciding to come back to this one either because they had something that they wanted to accomplish or they had something they needed to learn and the, and that this that the school this reality is really a school and that it's set up so that we don't remember our past lives because if we realized that we were on an evolutionary evolutionary journey over many lives it would change how we deal with life and i think that would be a good thing but nevertheless um, we do come back, I believe, to, to learn something, to deal with karma or whatever. And karma is not just if you did something bad, you're going to have something bad happen to you. It's, Edgar Casey said, it's kind of like a memory. It's like uh, you have some idea that keeps drawing things to you that are, is going to continue until you realize what is going on and do something about it. Um, an example might be uh, if you know anyone who seems to always attract someone of the opposite sex who doesn't treat them well, who abuses them. Well, there's something going on with that person that causes them to do that. And it may be it's because they have a low opinion of themselves and they keep attracting someone to them that is, has the same low opinion. In order to overcome that karma, they have to realize that's what's going on and, and develop a higher opinion of themselves. And that, that might be the thing they came back in this lifetime uh, to learn, to, to do. So, and sometimes it takes several lifetimes. <laughs> have you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day, for example? I think that's, a, that's an allegory of, of what I'm talking about. You know, he starts out as a, Bill Murray's character starts out as a real jerk and has all these experiences. and treats people like dirt and uh, and the jerk that he is. And eventually after an hour and a half or so of the movie, he's, he's had all these experiences again and again and again. And he finally, in the, in the last day, he treats them with love and respect and so on. And, and that's when he's able to move on to, to February 3rd. He also gets the girl, which is a good thing. So I think it is kind of an allegory of what uh, what's going on with us as human beings being born again and again and again until we get it right. Then put your little hand in mine There ain't no hill or mountain we can climb So it happens to to all of us? There's no, there's no um, discerning factors in there? It is just something that happens to, to all of us, you think? I think it up to, to you know, I think that there are people on earth today who maybe have learned the lessons and have come back. Uh, I think the, the Hindus have a, a word for that, uh, Mahatsvi God or something like that, where they're, they're coming back to try to help lead others out of this reality. That's what the Buddha uh, certainly was trying to do. Uh, but um, I think for most of us, we're here to learn. Some of us may be here to accomplish a particular mission, uh, but we all have a reason for being here. We didn't, we don't just, it's just not an accident that we come into this reality. And some would say it's really uh, quite a privilege to be able to come into this reality, that there are many more souls out there than there are spots to be taken on, on this planet. What, what's your kind of take on, on um, largely children, largely the under fives, who have some of these past life memories without going into hypnotic regression? Um, 
And also, I'm sure you've come across pre-life memories, not of a time in the void between lives, but of, of being before they were born. Um, kids who have memories of choosing their parents, for example. Stories like, oh, mummy, I remember when you had the orange car. Yet mummy sold the orange car before baby was born. That Those sort of little... Uh, quite anomalous stories, but they're there and they're very, very difficult to just uh, to turn off and not listen to. There is something to it. Yeah, there's a unit of the University of Virginia Medical School called uh, the Division of per Perceptual Studies that has been studying uh, children's memories of past lives all the way back to 1960. Uh, a Canadian named Ian Stevenson, who was a professor at the University of Virginia Medical School, a psychiatrist, started this. And he got a grant from, uh, I think it was the founder of Xerox, who was interested in Hinduism, Buddhism, and, and gave the university a bunch of money to study this. And he, uh, back in the early days, in the 60s, uh, spent a lot of time going to India and talking to children who remembered past lives. And they would be able to uh, say, yeah, well, I was, I lived over in this village that's 25 miles away. And they would take him over there and say that they would, the child would lead him to the house. And then he would be able to name all the people that were living there. And, and, and during these 60 years, the University of Virginia has, has a, uh, compiled studies on over, I think it's 2,700 of these cases now. And over half of them, they've been able to find the person the child thought he was in the previous life and, and it checks out in terms of you know, names and places and dates and so on and so forth. And so it really is very hard to, to dispute. And, but one of the things that seems to be a common with these children with past life memories is that they have come back fairly quickly. Uh, because they have so many now, uh, they're able to you know, put it all in a computer and, and find out you know, what the different commonalities are based on that. And, what, and the average time between lives of children who remember past lives is 15 months. So apparent, and the other commonality is that almost all of them died of unnatural causes. Either they were murdered, they were killed in an accident, they were killed in a war, but they didn't live a full life the previous time. And so they have come back fairly quickly and they don't have that veil of forgetting that we talked about earlier. Is they there something their of the trauma, for example, that's maybe causing that then? Well, the, the could, high could, energy traumatic passing? It could be. One of the other commonalities uh, is that something like 35% of them have birthmarks indicating how they were killed in the previous life. You know, uh, one guy who came back and, uh, the lower part of his leg was missing. He was run over by a train. Uh, so one of the classic ones is there was a school teacher, I think it was in Thailand, who was murdered on his way to school. He was riding his bicycle and he was shot in the forehead. And when he came back, he had a birthmark, a circle on his forehead and a big splattered birthmark on the back of his head where the exit wound was. And he was able to take Stephen, Ian Stevenson to his home and uh, his wife in the previous life was there. And, and, and there were records uh, in, in the morgue of how the guy was killed and where the wound was and it all matched up. So yeah, it has something to do with either their life being cut short or it being a, a traumatic death. And, and they, I guess, feel short, short changed. And so they come back. Uh, one of the best stories is the one about, I think his name is James Liger who Actually, it was a whole lot more than 15 months when he came back. He apparently was a uh, pilot in World War II who was shot down at the Battle of Iwo Jima in, in, in the Pacific in April of 1945. And he remembered the, the aircraft carrier that he, the name of the aircraft carrier that he flew off of. He remembered the name of his 
his buddies on the ship and his father took him to a reunion of the uh, people on the ship and he was able to recognize them. I said, gosh, they're so old now. You know, this kid was six years old at that time. So yeah, it's, very, it's really very interesting. What do you think it will take to get to a point where we can prove or disprove some of this? Well, you know, I think that there's so much evidence that it's hard to, to I mean, you know, science wants to have an experiment that you can replicate. Well, one of the experiments that I mentioned in the uh, book you, you talked about earlier, uh, Consciousness, the hard, hard problem solved, is the is the ex experiment in quantum mechanics where you have the double slit, where you shoot photons through the two slits, and if those, if no measurement, if no record is kept of where when a particular show photon was shot and where it hit, then a uh, wave pattern. It, forms on the screen, which is what happens when light, you know, to goes through two different slits and one uh, forms waves where light and dark, light and dark, because one wave overlaps the other. But if the scientist uh, keeps a record of where they, makes a record of where they were shot, either before the slit or after the slit, then you get a pattern of dots on the screen. Well. How does that happen? It's got to be because the researcher, the scientist, knows where the slits, you know, where the, the photons went. Or he doesn't know. So his knowledge is what causes the difference. To me, that shows that mind is everywhere, not inside the head. So it is an experiment that has been replicated many, many times. So it, it already, those experiments already exist. And then the preponderance of evidence of things like the University of Virginia and their, uh, their children past lives thing. How do you explain that away? You know, how do, <laughs> it's, it's like water building up behind a dam. Eventually it's got to just break through and crash down the valley, you know, and it's coming. I think it is coming. When you got, you know, hundreds, thousands of them, what do you do then? And that's what they had, is thousands of them. I have, to, I have to research after we've spoken and send you the link. It is ion-based energy photography. It's a little bit like aura photography. And these researchers were, were taking energy photographs, so photographing, like, energy fields around things like insects, lizards, leaves. And... They were discovering things, and there were a few weird things too. So I'll have to find it because I don't know it all off the top of my head, but I'll find it and I'll send you the link to their, their piece of work. They were finding things like when the leg of, oh, this is horrible to, to think of, but when the leg of a lizard was cut off and then he was photographed without his leg, the energy field still showed the leg, the outline still showed the leg, implying that the physical body wasn't creating the energy field the energy right. field for the lizard was somehow intact and even when you removed part of the lizard i'm sure i don't know if they cut his leg off themselves or how that worked but i'll have to as i say i'll find the work for you but it's i'm not sure exactly how that ties in but it just it does tie in somewhat to, to you this. i think it does because uh, in fact i have he's passed away now but i had an uncle who who lost a leg in a motorcycle accident and he said that he still could feel his toes uh, and his I've feet. This. It's yeah. a phantom limb, I think it's called. Yeah. So yeah, that would be that would go along with what you just said, what you're talking about. Yeah. I have a website uh, that is easy to remember. Uh, it's S H Martin S H M A R T I N all run together dot com. You can go to that, and up at the top, there's a menu, and on the little square that says books, you can click on that, and you'll see my books, and you can click on any of the covers, and it'll take you to a page where you can find out more about it. 
maybe read the first couple of chapters, uh, buy it if you like. And um, so I hope people will do that, shmartin.com. And I have, a, I have a Facebook page and so forth too, but I think the easiest thing to do is to go to that website. And I have a blog on there and I have uh, some videos on there that I've done. I also have a v uh, YouTube channel. I haven't done anything with it recently, but a number of videos on that. So uh, I hope people will, uh, will take advantage of that. Do you have any cool ideas for what's coming up in, in, in the near future? You're working yeah, on yeah. I, I'm, working on, I'm working on a book right now that is talking about, uh, and then we've, we've touched on this in, in this interview, of how we're moving into what some people call the fourth density, which is we're moving from third density where we're self-aware to fourth density where we're aware that all is one and that we're in that transitional period now. And it's time for each of us to make a decision how we're going to proceed in that, whether we're gonna be service to self or service to others. And that of course comes from the law of one and Ra, but I do think there's something to it. And that's what my next book, which will be coming out pretty soon is all about. What an absolute joy and, and a privilege to speak with you. Thank you so much. Um, for taking the time to come and talk through your work. Um, I, as I, f I feel as always, we're only scraping the iceberg with you, but hopefully we can talk again in the future and, and, and dig a little deeper together. Well, I hope so. I'll send you a PDF of uh, my new book when I'm done with it. Maybe you'll get to be interested in that. We can talk about it. Stephen, what a privilege. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really, really appreciate you coming and talking with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Mark. I've enjoyed it very much. Appreciate it. Here Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson, as part of the Fearscape Media Network. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash Peer Beyond the Veil or on Twitter at Peer Beyond the Veil or at Peer Beyond 2020. Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people 